a minute. Later in the Fallon Forum today, we're going to talk with Mike Smith, formerly with the Attorney General's Office and with Governor Culver's Office, about the wisdom, or lack thereof, of funding a private lake. And we're also going to talk about, honey, I shrunk the bees. Well, we're going to talk with our state apiarist, Joe, uh, Andy Joseph, about the uh, problems associated with chemicals for corn affecting colony collapse with bees. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Oh, oh. What's the matter, distressed home buyer? I've been trying forever to buy a home, and I'm having a terrible time. I wish I knew where to go for help. Well, I'm Joe Henry, licensed realtor, and I'm here to save the day and help you buy your home. I've been helping people buy homes in central Iowa for over 10 years. I've even got a full-size truck to help you move. My hero. Thank goodness I found you. Make Agent Joe Henry your home buyer hero, too. Visit AgentJoeHenry.com. That's AgentJoeHenry.com. Are you hungry? Do you want hot, delicious food delivered fast? Call Burger Time Speedy Taco Delivery. Serving the Des Moines Metro. Burgers, tacos, Philly steak sandwiches, tenderloins, burritos, and more. And be sure to try their Hearthstone Pizza. Call 287-4224. That's 287-4224. Burger Time Speedy Taco Delivery. They get dinner to you so fast you won't believe it. Online at BurgerTaco.com. Community CPA is the 15th largest CPA firm in Iowa, providing audit, tax, and accounting services. Community CPA specializes in international tax treaty and double taxation avoidance among countries and states. Nine dedicated, experienced, hardworking staff are the company's foundation, and their compassion towards every client is the secret behind Community CPA's success. At Community CPA, you can expect quality service year-round. Call 288-3188. Community CPA, 3816 Ingersoll. Experience the difference. I'm a burrito. I'm a fighting burrito full of fresh ingredients prepared before your very eyes. I don't have eyes. I have over 28 options and 268 million combinations, including Rizzo for vegetarians. I can take my meat off and call myself vegetarian. Put that back on. The fighting burrito is locally owned right here in Ames. I'm owned by some big corporation somewhere. Say, you want to go on a date? No, thanks. I'm seeing a quesadilla. The fighting burrito in their new location at 117 Welch Avenue by Iowa State. Online fightingburrito.com. Join the fight. From the Remax Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Downtown, downtown by our own brother Trucker. If you're a bumblebee or a honeybee or a queen bee and you're listening and watching the show today, you need to call at 244-0077. Or if you're calling long distance, if you're a queen bee living in some other part of the state, 855-244-0077. Because if you don't call and defend yourself, how do you expect us humans to do it? Things are rough at bee country. And with me on the, uh, on the show today is uh, state apiarist Andy Joseph. Andy, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks, Ed. Hi. Thanks for taking the time to join us. Um, sure. Things are not looking good for bees, and I think people don't understand just how important it's not just another insect. It's not something you can forget about. Uh, bees are probably the most important insect in the entire insect kingdom. I like to think so. Well, you certainly, <laughs> I don't know if I can your, prove your that scientifically, it, but so, I sure yeah. uh, do want to put that out. But there's two studies recently that, that suggest that if we don't get our, if we don't figure out what's killing off bees, um, we could be in trouble. And one of those studies fascinated me. It was done by the French, French scientists who glued transmitters to bees. 
I, I'm, I'm just in awe at how they could pull that off, first of all. But, but what, um, what did they learn in performing that, uh, that, that experiment? Well, for a long time, uh, we've had this, this wild idea that pesticide exposure to uh, bees, in particular insecticides, does actually harm beneficial insects. You know, we have to use these chemicals in, in you know, agriculture to protect our crops from pests. But we want to use them wisely so that we're protecting our uh, pollinators and our beneficial insects at the same time. Yeah. But we, especially being here in Iowa with millions of acres of crops, oftentimes uh, bees and beekeepers are, are in conjunction with that land. Um, and there's overlap. So the avenues of exposure are just almost endless. And people have been saying for a long time, well, what, a decade, two decades now? We've got a problem. Bees seem to be struggling. They seem to be in decline. Some want to blame climate change. Some say it's a little mite. Now, some are saying it's chemicals and the evidence, the evidence uh, suggesting that it is farm chemicals, including one chemical commonly used on, on corn. I mean, pretty much universally used on corn. That's right. Yeah. There's a, a particular class of insecticides called neonicotinoids. And there are a whole range of chemicals that fall out of there. Neonicotinoids. That's Nicotine. right. So They're this is affecting a... the nicotine receptors in the insect's nervous system. So is this like a, is this like a bee smoking a cigarette? <laughs> well, similar chemistry there. Uh, their nervous system uh, it, it basically can be overloaded by these compounds and cause them to really go high energy into convulsions, uh, seizures. And obviously, if their muscles are spasming and their body isn't functioning, then they can't do what bees do, which is forage and pollinate and bring back food to support their colony as a whole. Instead, they, they die. So it is, it is really, it is nicotine, like a nicotine addiction almost. Uh, Same yeah. chemical compound. Of course, their nervous system is much simpler than ours, right. but basically the same things are at work. And if you block these receptors, right. then you, your nerves aren't firing properly. And when those electrical and chemical signals are, are you know, interrupted, everything falls apart and you, you die. <laughs> okay, so, so this, uh, this chemical is applied to corn in order to control... Uh, some pests. I'm not quite sure what, what pests are being uh, prevented from eating the corn plant. Sure. Well, it's not just corn, you know, depending on where you are in the world. It's corn, rape, beans, all sorts of different things. Carry Soybeans, these seed even? treatments. And it's actually, you know, in theory, this is a wonderful thing. Instead of coming over these crops, blanketing these broad spectrum insecticides, you know, as the crops are growing, put a little bit on a seed, let that grow up. And then anything that's coming along and munching on that plant since this chemical becomes part of every cell of that plant, it you get exposed directly through contact. So you're not okay. just spraying through the whole landscape. So it's be, wonderful in theory, except for these things end up being expressed in the pollen and nectar as well. Uh, so, so, so it's it's the pollen that, that gets uh, transmitted by the bee. That that's where they're getting the uh, exactly. their, their lethal dose of this chemical from. Yeah, that's where you know things fall apart for your beneficial insects is when you've got. Uh, pollinators, not just honeybees, but, uh, you know, butterflies, moths, anything that visits this, uh, uh bumblebees, you know, all of your native bees, uh, you know, certain birds, things like this hummingbird suck nectar out of flowers, any plant that had these seed treatments, that chemical compound is going to be available in some quantity in your nectar and pollen. Now I'm, I'm looking at this, uh, one of the articles I've been uh, reading up on here, uh, bear ecotoxicologist, David Fisher said the honeybee study used unrealistic high do unrealistically high doses of the chemicals, um, amounts that would not be used on crops bees normally pollinate. So Bayer, the producer of this chemical, uh, is basically dismissing the, uh, the, the research as, um, as inadequate. Uh, again, continuing to insist on the, uh, on the uh, safeness of its product. And the EPA seems to be going along with that. Well, sure. There's a lot of money tied up in these things, and of course the companies are going to defend their product. I work for the Department of Agriculture here. I, I, I know I need to tread lightly on these, and it's a responsible thing to do. You know, if there is certainly no problem, then we need to go off on a different avenue, and we need to, you know, turn over other rocks and figure out what is harming the bees. We need to be careful about this, but in my uh, opinions, if you can call it that, my knowledge of this, these levels of these compounds that they used to feed the bees that were used in these studies aren't too far separated from real world con conditions. In fact, I brought a third study with me that came out of Purdue. They have issues there with these same chemical uh, chemicals finding ways you know, into beehives one form that, or another. Is that a recent study as well? A recent study just came out a few months ago. It's published in January. So we have a study and, from, uh, from France, one from Britain, one from the US, all very recent, all 
coming to the same conclusion that sure. this uh, bear produced chemical right. is a problem. Exactly. And in the Purdue study, what they're finding is a big deal. There are two things. Let me back up a minute. There are two parameters here. How much or what concentration of these chemicals are finding their way into nectar and pollen? That's one important element of this. Bayer wants to, to, stay, to say it's not very much, you know? And if that's true, then maybe we don't have anything to worry about. The fear is that these chemicals are making it up into nectar and pollen of these plants in decent quantities. And then the second question is how much is any individual bee going to, to drink, you know, or be fed? Yeah. So you've got what concentration is it is, and then the second part is how much is each bee eating. And, and don't, so don't, you've got to figure those numbers out before you can look at anything else. And I think that the, the levels that they used in these studies, they don't seem too far-fetched in my mind, okay, so especially th since the Purdue study, I know I keep talking over you, but i got to get no, this no, thought I'll, out, I'll go ahead, go ahead. finds that there's the residual that's left right. in the field. How fast does this stuff break down? The Purdue study says that it's up to nearly a thousand days what we call half-life, you know, where half of it has been broken down into less problematic compounds, but half of it remains active. So in the fields, right here in this part of the Midwest, up to a thousand days later, you still have half that field application dose. So think what happens if so you plant three a field years for later. three years, yeah. you, when you plant that, you've already got two times your label dosage actively in the soil, ready to come up through the plants. Well, and then you keep adding to that. Presumably, you're using it the following year as well. I mean, maybe you rotate right. your oh, crops, well, but even on soybeans, you're using this chemical. Sure. Yeah. And in theory, you know, that's that's how these these uh, rates, mm -hmm. the application rates are developed, is how much needs to be in here, especially if you're not corn on corn on corn. But with corn prices up, the pressure for, yeah, sure. for growers, very understandably, is to keep that in corn as long as possible. Right. When you do that, then you can anticipate higher pests. So levels. Co so corn so uses, then you, you, these chemicals become more important in defense of their crop. Cor corn uses so. more of the chemical than soybeans. So if you are planting corn on corn, you're getting a higher concentration of residue left in the soil. In, yeah, it, as related to these experiments, you know, that's contextual. Yeah. Right. Yep. So, so basically all three of these studies are saying the same thing, that this is an issue. Right, and there are more studies that are coming out. University of Minnesota, the uh, Dr. Spivak's lab up there has some really interesting stuff going on. Again, field studies, not lab studies. Mm. It's easy to be critical. What happens if you put some bees in a little box, you know, in a lab incubator and give them doses of this stuff? What happens? It's another thing when you're trying to work in the real world, you know, actual colonies of bees foraging in the actual landscape and looking at what happens. These studies are really complicated because of that because there's so many other variables and factors that you have to sort of weed out scientifically. So, so, so. The, the scientific community is pretty clear that these studies are, are, are valid. Well, yes. I, I think that the science of these, uh, these articles right here, these three, the one from France, the one from England, and now the one from Purdue, I, I don't honestly know how anybody can really fight what this is. Okay, now, well, the second question is, how is this the whole explanation for this thing colony collapse disorder where you've got a good hive of bees next time you check it it's dwindling down next time you go there it'd be basically empty is this the whole issue or is it part of the puzzle is i think still remains i don't think that any of these studies really add up to say this is it hands down solved hmm. but i don't think that you can fight with what they're finding you know you see less foraging activity you see foragers not returning and you see high levels of insecticides remaining in the fields even fields that are fallow not being right. used for agricultural production, still these compounds are in the soil. And since they're systemic, they become taken up by the plants. They become part of every cell of that plant. I, I want still to, are expressing I want to stuff. get your take on, on what, what Bayer Corporation's response is and what the EPA should do. I mean, the, there are some who claim the EPA has been foot dragging and should be restricting this chemical and that they're not doing that. And I'm also really curious about what this means for Iowa's corn crop should okay. the EPA take action. Um, I do want to I, I want to share a video with people that I think um, it's brief and I think it really gets to the point of s some of what we're tra talking about here today. It's uh, it, well, uh, we'll we'll we'll, fl we'll uh, flip to that Mandy when you get a second but uh, folks, when we come back from that video, you're welcome to call the show as well. We are always uh, like, like, love to have listener input, 244-0077, or toll-free, it's 855-244-0077. Check this out. See, there's a handful of bees in that, but sugar's running out. They didn't eat their sugar yet. 
For Brett Aidy, the largest commercial bee operator in the States, inspecting his 70,000 hives in California is a depressing business. Nothing. Just, just really depressing. More than a third of his bees were wiped out. It's a similar story across the rest of the United States. Hives that had ate all their protein and, and looked really healthy and first of December had just disintegrated to little knots of bees and they continue to disintegrate. And we tried to salvage some of them by closing them down to a single box so they conserve heat and they still disintegrated after that. Just, just really just Don't know what to say. How, how many did you lose? A lot. A lot. Brett moved all of his 70,000 hives to California for the almond pollination, the largest managed pollination event in the world. He's not alone. 40 billion bees are trucked in. The almond trees are dependent on the bees to bear fruit. As the 60 million trees start to blossom, growers will be renting 1.2 million bee colonies. One of California's bee brokers, Joe Trainer, matches almond growers with beekeepers from all over the United States. It's a critical time of year. Timing is, is real important, and if one beekeeper's not ready, uh, doesn't have his bees ready, we have to put another beekeeper in there if the growers. Uh, orchard starts blooming, and he's demanding his bees, we've got to juggle things around and, and uh, you know, get his orchard filled before it starts blooming. Already this year, he's seen some beekeepers closing up shop. We have three beekeepers this year that uh, their colonies weren't acceptable for our standards, and I don't, I don't know if they're renting them elsewhere, but uh, if they don't, they won't have any almond pollination income this year. And if you don't have any almond pollination income, you, it's very difficult to stay in the bee business. Opinions on what's causing hives to empty vary. Government scientists like Frank Asian would like to see more research. It would be nice if we knew a lot, of, a lot more about the impact of agricultural chemistry and our own uh, things that we put into the colonies. It, it, it would be nice to know that. I think we have to be careful. I'm not saying it's not that. I'm just saying before we lead ourselves into believing that that's a major problem, we have to be, have to set up very careful testing to prove it. California produces 80% of the world's almonds. As the trees come into blossom, growers and beekeepers will be watching nervously. Okay, so Andy, that film is from 2008. And um, that's a while ago in terms of um, how the science has moved forward. That, that beekeeper's reservations about, about evidence, my, my impression is that people these days who are watching this issue, that are, that are paying attention, that are involved with uh, bee production or fruit and vegetable production that depends on bees, are um, becoming more clear about the, uh, at least one of the causes of the problem. And, and again, these, these three recent studies pretty much uh, confirm that. Mm -hmm. Oh, certainly. You know, and this is the way science works. You know, we've had this, this issue identified since, what, about 2005, 2006. A lot of different researchers have jumped on this, trying to figure this out and save this industry from, you know, this, this big disastrous colony collapse disorder. And so you hypothesize something, you make an educated guess, maybe it's this, and then you go after that. And the process takes time, and we bounced around from viruses, you know, particular viruses maybe that are setting off this dwindling down to nothing. We've looked at fungal parasites and pathogens. We've looked at things that are related to this terrible uh, parasite, the varroa mite, which is a, a real colony herder, <laughs> whether it's uh, directly related to colony collapse disorder or not. And now pesticides are coming back up. Yeah. And if you think the, the earliest research that was done on colony collapse disorder, of course, looked at sublethal effects of insecticides. But in those studies, they couldn't really find anything critical uh, to really point a finger at. Now with time and experience, you know, more serious things are surfacing. Yeah. Well, I, I'd love to get a, a little better take, too, on some of the, the local impacts, uh, both on beekeepers, again, on fruit and vegetable growers, and on the corn, corn farmers as well, because they, it's almost like there's, there's, a, there's a conflict between one arm of agriculture and another. Uh, let's uh, go to our phone lines, 244-1800, uh, 
Double O double seven. If you want to join the conversation with myself, uh, Ed Fallon here, and uh, Andy Joseph, the uh, state apiarist. Uh, let's go to uh, uh, Kay. Hello, Kay. Hello. Welcome to the show. Hey, thank you very much. Yeah, I, I yeah, I think the value of science is very important. Obviously, in an issue like this, and you know, science has pointed to problems in global warming. I guess I get concerned when people aren't listening to science anymore and um, how are we going to provide advocacy on this issue beyond scientific information? How are we going to get people interested in something like this? Um, because it seems like just a small thing, a bee. So how do we... Right. Yeah. I think you're exactly right. There is a disconnection, you know, between what goes on in universities and then what actually makes it to people and affects our choices and our the way that we go through our daily lives. And that's a difficult hurdle to get over. You know, these these studies aren't something that you're going to see printed in your newspaper. Uh, there, there's something, you know, that's kind of feeding back into the community. Let's look down these avenues further. And you have to be able to eventually say, OK, we're confident enough about this that we need to make a jump towards making changes you know, to protect and, and help out the bee populations in this example. And I don't know that I have the, the perfect, you know, real world answer, but I think it all starts with what's already going on. And that's uh, an increased awareness of where your food is coming from and the importance of pollinators. I have conversations with people, you know, because of what I do uh, for a living all the time, beekeepers and non-beekeepers. And I think that awareness is really skyrocketing these days. There have been so many different food safety issues and the bee thing has captured media attention. The pink slime the thing. The pink slime thing is another one. You know, the list goes on and on and on. Oh, yeah. uh, a couple of years ago, it was eggs and, and all these, these issues. You know, we're feeding a whole lot of people. We're trying to do a good job at that. Uh, and then when things break down a little bit, the public is becoming more aware than what they ever yeah. were before. Yeah, and, pe pe and that's not a bad thing. Yeah, that's kind of a good result of these other a, maybe negative things. It's a great result, but, but people, it, and people can make that connection when, it, when, the, when, the, when the link is obvious. But when you're talking about uh, a chemical, a bee, and your apple or orange or your, 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 your strawberry, it's harder for people to make that link. Mm -hmm. So, sure. Kay, is that where you were going with this uh, question? Yeah, that's definitely where I'm going with it. The other problem I see, too, is that we just have the corporate agriculture is so strong, and there's a huge profit margin, you know, for probably producing, you know, the chemical, that how do we, how do we motivate them to back off on this type of thing? Well, I, I don't think that any growers, I'm pretty confident in saying this, they're not out to kill bees. You know, again, it's an awareness issue, and it's what we have to, to work with, what choices are available for things like pest control. Uh, and if we're in this system, I, I would argue that the, there isn't probably a huge profit margin for individual growers. You know, everything is on this corporate thing, and you end up having to farm huge quantities to be able to make a living. You're talking about so, individual corn growers, for exactly. example. Exactly. For corn growers, yeah. We'll okay. use corn as an example again. You know, that it's not like there's this evil group of farmers, and the beekeepers are these righteous, noble group, and we're at war with each other. But I think that's the sort of the dynamic that gets painted a but, lot. But there might be and, an evil corporation named Bear, for example, that doesn't really care about, you know, farmers on either camp, corn farmers or fruit farmers or beekeepers that really just want to make money and don't mind suppressing information from, you know, from scientists that are saying, hey, this chemical needs to be regulated. Well, maybe you're not willing yeah. to say that, but I am. <laughs> I have to be very careful <laughs> at what I say because, well, because I want to be accurate and also because I work for the Department of Agriculture. Sure. We struggle with these issues. We want to do the right thing. There, it, it, I, I have been very impressed with the people that I work with. You, I, I, I think coming right out of school and going into this job several years ago, I would have expected I would have been more alone, you know, in my opinion, fighting the good fight, you know, the crusade right. for the little neglected pollinators out there. But the reality is, is that these are all challenges and we, we struggle to, to do the right thing as regulators. And we are, we're dealing with a, a uh, powerful industry and with powerful corporations and we have to be very careful at the decisions that are made reflecting what the people want and what's best for the environment and all these issues make sure that we're making good decisions there as regulators so that industry survives this is a very very important thing for right. Iowa and also 
be able to protect and, and conserve well, our pollinators. Well, the 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 um, the beekeeping industry is is nothing to to sneeze at in terms of uh, its kind of contribution to the economy, both in terms of beekeepers themselves, but in terms of the uh, folks who grow fruits and vegetables. I mean, that sector of Iowa agriculture is 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 increasing significantly. It really is. It and, really is. And that in itself is a, a piece of the solution. You know, if we put our landscape into almost a factory landscape, make corn and beans and nothing else. Pretty much what we've done. Things, you know, we see things uh, being damaged through that. So we add in, you know, conservation strips and, and CRP ground and, and buffer zones. Terracing. And we encourage mm. and, and, you know, which basically means subsidize uh, to some extent, you know, different crops and different fruit and vegetable production, what we call specialty crops. Right. And horticulture in this avenue or that avenue and beekeeping. Uh, and you, you encourage that diversity in the landscape. And hey, things get healthier. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's it's it, it makes a lot of sense. It's just you have so much mass that you're trying to push in that direction. These are slow changes, but I think the more diversity that we have in Iowa, it's better for our economy. It's better for our industries. And hey, it ends up being better for our pollinators. But you too. also have conflicts that develop, and here, this is a good example. Because, it is because I is. imagine corn yeah. farmers are not going to want to give up on that chemical because it's apparently been fairly effective at controlling certain pests that eat corn crops. Even that has come under some controversy. Uh, if you talk to people at ISU, uh, Matt O'Neill is one. I hope he doesn't mind me throwing this out there. But he's done some research that he's actually found uh, a couple examples, limited examples, where these chemicals aren't actually as effective at their target pests as what we would hope or be told. So I don't know how yeah. you well, know I, uh, strong those studies were. I don't know where the future is on those. but. Mm -hmm. There's a lot that's under question right well, now. Part of my concern is that they bring in a new chemical that maybe doesn't have the same effect on bees. Maybe it has an even worse effect on something else in the ecosystem. I mean, it, at some point, how do we... And again, I, I, you know, I, I'm an organic gardener myself, but I understand that there may be times where some chemical application is needed. But it almost seems that we've, we've developed a system that is dependent upon chemicals intentionally by design. I mean, and that certainly is evident when you see chemical companies like Monsanto and DuPont owning what used to be seed companies. So now sure, that the, sure. the seeds being designed are dependent upon the chemicals. Yeah, so, yeah. So if you're a, a corn grower, we'll just continue on and on with corn. Uh, it's a huge commodity crop in Iowa, so it makes sense to use it as an example. You don't have a choice anymore whether or not you're going to buy seed that contains these chemicals in the coating on the seed yeah. when you buy it. You cannot buy seed that doesn't have it unless you're going all the way organic. And even then, you're risking being sued if that chemical containing or the the pollen say containing this technology even blows by wind onto your field sure and you know gets uptaken by yeah. your crops ends up in your your corn seeds that you've produced even there are copyright laws right. and all sorts of things like that so and monsanto has very, had lawsuits very difficult it's had lawsuits on that and one one against farmers who happen to be the victims of of, uh, of drift I mean, that's maybe a, a, a tangential issue, but... Yeah, yeah. Well, but it, it all kind of comes back. You know, I think that is kind of a whole separate subject, but it, mm. it just, I think, reflects, if nothing else, how hard it is to do something else. These aren't yeah. really realistic, real-world choices. If you're a corn farmer, you will be using this seed. You don't have much of a choice right, right now. I mean, these are GMO seeds we're talking about. Uh, yeah, but in, in these examples, which basically means like uh, BT and some other things, which in theory, are very, very good things. Uh, and that's a whole nother... <laughs> BT used to be a key a key weapon in the arsenal of an, an, an organic farmer, but with sure. it, it, it's, it, its use now has basically denigrated the, uh, the ability of organic farmers to use that product effectively. And that's maybe getting a little bit too tentacle, but... Sure. Well, you know, it all comes back. We've got so many acres, millions of acres planted in a couple crops. We've taken Iowa with, you know, our soils and all this that we have to be proud of, it came from the diversity of hundreds of you know native plants growing on them annually, thousands growing and probably, dying. Yeah. You know, hundreds per acre, I guess, is yeah. where I'm getting that. Thousands of different species. Sure. sure. Um, you take that diversity out. You plant it with corn and beans. You're going to have insect insect problems where these pest insects develop huge populations because they live in the middle of a smorgasbord. Yeah. So everything is on their side. Then you have to battle that with pesticides, and that's where pollinators kind of end up on the short end of the stick. So they're uh, beneficial insects. Nobody wants to hurt them, but they live in a, a really toxic environment. I don't think that you can argue that. Is there any uh, expectation that the Department of Agriculture, the Iowa Department of Agriculture, 
or the USDA for that matter, but you're more familiar with, with the uh, state scene, is there any expectation that they might come out with a position on this issue relevant to the new research being released? Well, again, that's I'm the B guy. You're the B guy. <laughs> Everything is pretty compartmentalized. Yeah. You know, the pesticide folks I know are aware of these things. Uh, we've been emailing a little bit back and forth. It's on their minds. Right. But we are bound to science and law. We can only enforce things if there's evidence in law behind it. And mm -hmm. that's where the state, we don't necessarily create these laws and restrictions. We enforce what the EPA says is safe or unsafe that's how they get involved might, might be good for me to get bill northy on this show huh the, uh, that would of be egg. wonderful he is a great guy or somebody with the uh with the uh, farm bureau or the uh, iowa corn growers association i'm curious about whether they have a viewpoint on this but... i bet they do and to be honest you know i should probably be more aware on a personal level of where yeah. they're coming from and what their sides you know i i don't think it's too much to assume that they don't want to harm pollinators. Right. And we're basically waiting on this mountain of evidence. And the, 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 uh, the critical question that comes out of this is how much evidence is necessary yeah. before it's just ridiculous? Do we really need more studies well, before we make decisions on how to use these chemicals I or mean, if I, we should I, be? I think any them. rational person has got to look at these studies and say, wow, the verdict is in. Uh, I mean, there may still be other factors. This is the tip of the and, iceberg. And we're, climate change. Yes. Yeah. Who knows? But this is pretty clear, emphatic stuff. These chemicals are causing problems. Is the EPA going to grow a pair and do something about it, or are they going to continue to be pressured by Bayer? Are you know our leading organizations here in Iowa that represent corn farmers going to try to be more proactive about trying to find a solution that both allows corn farmers to continue to be viable while protecting um, our environment and the the huge and growing industry, you know, food, uh, uh, fruits and vegetables that depend on bees. So. Sure. Yeah, time will tell. And I don't pretend like I have any answers to that. Oh, you that's know, why I invited don't you on the show. The I thought you had all the answers. <laughs> well, <laughs> get out of here. Yeah, no. <laughs> exactly. But I can say that these things are on the minds of beekeepers. Yeah. And I can say that it's a local issue. Uh, without wanting to point anyone out directly, we've got one of our biggest commercial beekeepers in the state is uh, based over on the eastern side, kind of east even of Makokota. And they're, they're through that location there, but they've got yards just up and down, you know, the river okay. and even on the other side of the river over in illinois he has kind of uh, wavered around the eight to ten thousand colonies range and he'll move which is those, a lot of bees and he'll move those hives to fruit and vegetable growers to help them pollinate their crops yep but yep he's, he's and then finding... in stationary yards just for honey yeah. production in good safer areas and then they go out to california for almond pollination but out of these eight thousand five hundred or so colonies that he had two years ago he lost 5,200 and wow. some odd colonies. In every one I inspected, you go into a yard, there are 32 colonies of bees in each one, arranged very systematically and very uniformly. Everything treated the same. They've been doing this since the 70s. Wow. The example, still food left, a tiny little cluster of bees that just shrunk to that number of bees that couldn't take care of itself and died over right. the winter time. I'd love to get him on my program sometime. That would be a good conversation from somebody who was out there raising bees and and experiencing the effects right away. Um, folks, um, <clears throat> excuse me, we're going to be back in a few minutes with another guest, Mike Smith, who was uh, with the Attorney General's office, and after that with Governor Culver's office. He wrote a very compelling piece in the Des Moines Register recently, and I love the title of it. Won't you help me, fi won't you help me fix my private playground? It's a conversation about the a dam on the Maquoketa River in uh, Lake, uh, Lake Delhi in eastern Iowa. Again, a private lake. And apparently uh, the state is willing to pump a bunch of money into helping them fix the dam when it broke during a flood not too long ago. We'll be back in a few minutes. Uh, I want to thank Webcast One Live for powering the show. I want to thank Physicians for Social Responsibility for helping to be one of our key sponsors. We'll be back in a few minutes. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Mmm, Mojo's. More local products from Iowa Farms than any other restaurant in Central Iowa. Mmm, Mojo's. The finest fresh Iowa-grown fruits and vegetables. Mmm, Mojo's. Savory Iowa pork, beef, chicken, and even ostrich. Mmm, Mojo's. Milk, cheese, eggs, and more from dairies right here in Iowa. Mmm, Mojo's. Large selection of local wines, beers, and spirits. Mmm, Mojo's. Mojo's on 86.com. 
I love driving to Newton to see the races. Me too, but I only have to drive across town. You live in Newton? Yep, Newton's got small town charm and it's close to Des Moines. I love the safe, friendly neighborhoods and family-owned businesses. And Newton's wind energy industry is really taking off. How'd you find your home? Dan Kelly with First Choice Realty. And Dan helped me find my office too. Next time, instead of just speeding by, I'll stop in and check out Newton. Why don't you check out Newton? Call Dan Kelly at 641-521-9260 or Kelly at mchsi.com. This moment of silence brought to you by Tally's Restaurant Bar and Catering, home of Des Moines' premier rooftop dining experience. Located in the heart of Beaverdale, Tally's offers speedy and affordable rooftop lunch, catering for events both large and small, innovative cuisine, as well as vegetarian and gluten-free menus. Come to Tally's for live music, dry-aged steaks, Sunday brunch, and all-you-can-eat ribs every Monday night. Tally's Restaurant Bar and Catering at 2712 Beaver Avenue. Call 279-2067. That's 279-2067. With warm weather finally here, it's time to think about upgrading the efficiency of your furnace and air conditioner. Leonard Tinker Heating and Cooling has provided honest, competent service for over 20 years. Whether it's your home or business, for repair work or to install a more energy-efficient furnace or air conditioner, call Leonard Tinker at 263-0422. That's 263-0422. For honest, competent heating and cooling service, call Leonard Tinker at 263-0422. I'm Rob Spearman. I'm a broker owner of REMAX Real Estate Concepts in Des Moines, Iowa. Give us a call if you're looking at buying or selling a home, or if you're having trouble on your mortgage payments or looking to purchase foreclosures, we have the agents to help you, experienced, outstanding agents. Our office number is 515-276-2872, or if you'd like to look at homes, go to our website, homeconnectusa.com. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Welcome back to the Fallon Forum. We're going to talk about um, we're going to talk about somebody's private lake and whether or not your tax money should be used to fix it. First, I want to make a couple plugs here. Um, I want to thank uh, Leonard Tinker Heating and Cooling. And on uh, tomorrow's show or Friday show, I'm not sure which, we're going to give away a free air conditioning check to one of our listeners. Could be you. Um, maybe you don't even have an air conditioner. If you do, you might want to get it checked for free by uh, a guy who's been doing this for 35 years. Um, also, later this week, I'm going to give away a couple tickets to a local production by my friend Richard Maynard, who does a fantastic job with any theatrical effort he gets his hands on. And uh, also, this coming Sunday on Iowa Public Television at 4 p.m., uh, Ben Alloway's production, Heaven and Earth, Mass on the uh, Celtic journey is going to be showing again that's four o'clock uh this coming sunday on iowa public television Uh, great stuff and um uh gosh there's more to talk about but i want to get right to our conversation because with me in the studio is mike smith mike i i misspoke you were not with governor culver's administration you were appointed by governor culver to be on the task force that looked at the dam on lake delhi that broke uh when there what 
there was, I can't remember how many inches of rain fell, but it washed this dam away, it, flooded, uh, flooded Manchester. And I, I, I was always surprised that Manchester didn't sue Lake, Lake Delhi <laughs> myself. But now they want to come back. I mean, this is a private lake. It's not like there's a lot of public access. They want to come back and get the taxpayers to finance rebuilding that dam. They want the taxpayers to help, Ed. And, and just to, to clarify, I was actually recruited by the uh, deputy director of the Department of Economic Development to chair the legal committee for that task force. So that was my volunteer service. But okay. it gave me a lot of exposure uh, to public meetings uh, about that uh, that dam break. And, and uh, one of the first public meetings I went to featured a slideshow prepared by the Lake Delhi Recreation Association. This was the the private organization of homeowners around that lake. And they made that, they made the slideshow in 2005 when they were trying to get public money for dredging. This was 2005, five years before the dam uh, washed away. Um, and and they, they traced the history of Lake Delhi, which was actually built in the late 20s, a hydropower dam on the Makokota River. Right. And it's important to understand, this is called a lake. But think of a lake that's only 400 feet wide and about eight, nine miles long. It's it, a river it, that's been... It, it's an yeah. impounded river. It's uh, a clogged artery. And it, can I call it a clogged artery? <laughs> yes, you can, right, as far as I'm clogged concerned. Artery. And it's, it's the lined, clogged artery. lined with private docks on both sides. Right. Um, so, so in 2005, they made this video, and they showed this, uh, I, I should say, slideshow to the public officials. And then the president of the LDRA, the Lake uh, Delhi Recreation Association, a after he stopped the slideshow, uh, and talked, which talked about the success of the dredging in 2005, said the 2008 flood came along and undid the dredging from 2005 and 2006. So just think about this for a minute. <laughs> Two years before the dam washed out, a flood filled that impoundment back up with sediment that they had just dredged out two years earlier at a cost of more than two million dollars and they have debt still for that dredging and they that call was, it success right um, okay. now, who, who paid for the dredging in 2005 the legislature okay. uh, authorized a special taxing district and so a tax district issued bonds and about the amount of about $2 million, the homeowners still owe I remember the debt that. service on those bonds. I do remember. I, I remember uh -huh. that, and I'm not sure, but I think I was a no vote on that. <laughs> I'm hoping well, I was. If I was paying attention, I would have been a no vote. <laughs> in any case, uh, they've got debt for dredging that was done before the 2008 flood, before the 2010 flood, which washed out their dam and deposited even more sediment in parts of that, uh, what's now a dry dry bed right um what they want now is five million they want more but but the senate has uh passed a bill that would appropriate five million over two years to help rebuild the dam and what they'll get for that is another sediment trap you know, right. except that that won't begin well, to pay for it right, and they'll, then, they'll, they'll get a sediment trap but they'll also get lakefront property again because right now their expensive homes are nowhere near water correct that's correct. They've got a river flowing past them. And if they could appreciate the value of riverfront property, I believe that in time their property values would recover a lot. The problem is this playground was focused on jet skis, water skis, ski boats, and to, to some extent pontoon boats, motor-powered boats on flat water. And that's the only vision they have. That's all they can think about is to get that back. It's not practical. They're fighting nature. I think one of the things that changed here, and we don't have to talk about climate change, it's undeniable that Iowa has experienced more intense storms in the, in the last several years. Absolutely. That, what those intense rainstorms do is they, they have a magnifying effect on runoff. And so, and something else that's going on is, you know what the price of corn is and what's happened to the conservation reserve. There's more and more hill country in corn and soybeans. The Makokota River drains hill country. When those intense storms hit that, those crop fields, the sediment runoff is incredible. Right. And that's what's gone into that what's going into that river, and that's the kind of flood that washed that dam. So it's, if you look at the, the life of that lake from the 1920s through uh, 2008, uh, I imagine that most of the sedimentation occurred 
later in its history. That's right. That's definitely correct. Again, uh, with, and uh, and, and it, the, the change has been really dramatic. Okay. They like to say they got by from 1927 until uh, this century before they had to dredge. But now, all of a sudden, they're dredging the last two years. Yeah. Now, uh, I'd love to have somebody on the show defending why this is a good use of taxpayer money. But well, let me just quickly say that one of the things they will tell you is that it's a public lake. And, and, and I can respond to that. Any lake in Iowa that I can take a canoe in legally from even one point or floating downstream on the river that impounds is a public lake. But the question is, how public? That, that Lake Delhi was at the private end of the public-private spectrum. You know, so you, you, could, you could get your canoe legally, in there. Legally, you could float down the Maquoketa River, and there was, one, there was at least one boat ramp. But think about this on on 16 to 18 miles of shoreline, maybe one public boat ramp, and you could float down the river. The otherwise, rest of it's private. Uh, otherwise, you'd be getting up on somebody's private dock. That's right. And uh, That's they, right. they might shoot you or something. That's right. Well, I, I, I don't know about that. But stand your, stand I'm your ground sure, on your I'm private dock. I'm not sure dock. how welcome you would be. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, this seems like all kinds of wrong. Uh, I don't know how much more money the taxpayers would be asked to appropriate to, 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 to rebuild the lake and, or to dredge it again when that needs to happen. But, we'll be asked for more. <laughs> okay, but the, 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 the Senate, again, has approved $5 million. What's happening in the House? Well, the House does not have it in their version of the infrastructure bill. And what we hear is that, and I say we, uh, I'm, I'm the treasurer of Iowa Rivers Revival. I'm on the Iowa Rivers Revival Board. We watch legislation like this because we're interested in river restoration, uh, for which there's practically no money, uh, and public lake restoration is also a matter of interest uh, to us. Um, and, and so uh, the, what we hear is that uh, this is likely to go, still likely to go to conference committee between the House and Senate. Okay, so the House is pretty much against it. Well, Our uh, friends, the Republicans. Uh, are saying no to this piece of pork. At least it's not in their bill. <laughs> I mean, they so, have their own pork out yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so it's likely to go to conference committee. And, uh, I mean, who, who are the big advocates? Who really want Who's the legislator or legislators that really want this? Well, Senator— Who, who got the campaign contributions? Senator Tom Hancock, a Democrat— Who's retiring, he, right? Yes, he okay. is, and that's his Senate district. Does he have and a house on that lake? I don't think so. Is no, he likely I, to? I don't think that either. I, I don't attribute to, I, He's a. He seems like a nice guy, but he's he's supportive of that. There, I, I talked in my article, in my essay, about uh, being at a meeting in the governor's office where the Lake Delhi representatives came in and said they'd hired experts. And then they had introduced them, and they were lobbyists. <laughs> well, one of them is Larry Murphy, and I think I have a lot of respect for Larry Murphy. Oh, sure. Mayor of Oline, yeah, but, and former, former state uh, senator yeah, from Dubuque. Yeah, yeah. but so that's, like that's the kind of people that are working for this project. And, well, and, the former, and his brother, of course, is the former speaker of the Iowa House. So, yeah, that's... Quite an expert. I mean, <laughs> well, okay. an, effect, an effective expert. An effective perhaps. expert in yes. terms of getting your voice heard at the state capitol. Yep, that's so, right. Well, I mean, I, I guess I, we got to go to a break, Mike. We're going to come right. back and continue the conversation. Folks, if you want to join the uh, dialogue here with uh, Mike Murphy about Mike uh, Smith. Mike Murphy. <laughs> Mike Smith, sorry, I just popped that out there. Uh, we're talking about the uh, Lake Delhi Dam and. The question as to whether or not the taxpayer should be asked to finance the rebuilding of that dam. Uh, here at 244-0077, if you want to join the conversation, got some lines open. 244-0077. We'll be back in a minute on the Fallon Forum. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. <laughs> Well, good morning. This is the 7th of June in the Lord's year 2010, and this is day uno, one of webcastonelive.com. We will begin with Max World Live with my special guest, Tom Coates. In just a minute, there's Tom. Wait, he's Howdy. And uh, we will be live for the very first time on Webcast One Live. Someday we're going to look back on this and say, gosh, remember that old day in history 
wonder where Walter Cronkite was. He must have been around hanging there too. But actually, it's the beginning of Webcast One Live. And thank you for listening. Thanks, Rob Spearman and everybody who's put together this project together. And uh, we're ready to go live now. So thanks for listening to MaxWorldLive.com. I can't tell you that it's going real well from time to time, but it is going. Man. What's the matter, distressed home buyer? I've been trying forever to buy a home, and I'm having a terrible time. I wish I knew where to go for help. Well, I'm Joe Henry, licensed realtor, and I'm here to save the day and help you buy your home. I've been helping people buy homes in central Iowa for over 10 years. I've even got a full-size truck to help you move. My hero. Thank goodness I found you. Make Agent Joe Henry your home buyer hero, too. Visit AgentJoeHenry.com. That's AgentJoeHenry.com. Nestled in the heart of downtown, Ritual Cafe is one of Des Moines' most unique places, offering a wide variety of coffee and tea. Ritual Cafe also serves the only all-vegetarian menu in town. And Ritual Cafe is a cultural hub for artists and musicians, with a performance stage hosting local, national, and international talent. Make Ritual Cafe a part of your daily ritual on 13th Street between Locust and Grand in downtown Des Moines. And check out ritualcafe.com. Times are tough, and most people are just trying to make their cars last a little bit longer. That's why you should know about Sargent's Garage in Des Moines. You can trust Sargent's to make the right diagnosis and give you a fair price. Whether it's a routine oil change or a major repair, Sargent's always does outstanding work. So don't give up on that old car just yet. Call Sargent's Garage at 246-8149. That's 246-8149 for Sargent's Garage. Open Sesame is Des Moines' premier Lebanese cafe. This month, Open Sesame is offering an unbeatable lunch special on Monday and Tuesdays. Mention the Fallon Forum when you order anything on Open Sesame's delicious lunch menu and get the second item for half price. That's right, buy one, get one for half price. Open Sesame's pita wrap, salad, soup, and mouth-watering Mideastern specialties will have you and your dining partner coming back again and again. Open Sesame at 313 East Locust Street in Des Moines' historic East Village. From the Remax Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Thank all of our local uh, musicians for helping to provide some great bumper music. That's Mary McAdams. Got uh, Mr. Baber's Neighbors, um, great bluegrass band. And, of course, uh, Brother Trucker with their tune downtown. i got to correct myself. I get my M towns mixed up. I said Manchester was affected by the uh, breaking of the Delhi Dam. Nope. It wasn't Manchester or Makoka. It was Monticello. Anyway. And, again, Mike's, Mike's assuring me that... Uh, the primary damage in Monticello probably would have happened anyhow because of the uh, the uh, extent of the uh, the uh, downpour. But so stand corrected. But you know, I want to let, let me ask you this, Mike. Um, I mean, there there are lots of lakes in this state that are public lakes that need dredging, that need improvements. And um, my understanding is, uh, looking at the uh, most recent um, position of the legislature on funding, and again. Uh, it's not done yet. There's still another couple weeks to go. But they're talking about the Senate has approved $5 million just for Lake Deli, which is pretty much a private lake. And it has approved $5.5 million for other lake restoration in Adams County, Buena Vista, uh, Calhoun, Carroll, Cerro Gordo, Dickinson, Johnson, Monroe, Jones, Palo Alto, Potawatomi, Sac County, Shelby, Story. I mean, you're talking about all these other lakes that have the same level of appropriation as one private lake. I mean, that's that's something is wrong with this picture. Yeah, Somebody has a lot of cloud up there in uh, in uh, in Lake Delhi country. I, I think it's fair to say that uh, public lake restoration projects are starved for money. At the same time, they're the legislature's proposing to hand out almost that same amount of money that they give to all the others just for Delhi, uh, and and. Uh, just one example here, Big Creek. 
if you've if you've yeah. read or, or listened to the news about Big Creek Lake right out here at Polk City, it's about a 900 acre lake, a public lake, as public as a lake can get, surrounded by a state oh, park. Oh, it's entirely public. Entirely yeah. public. Yeah. It's in bad shape in terms of water quality, and it's because of the runoff, the ag runoff, primarily ag runoff, into, into the lake. Um, money is needed to, to, to do restoration work in that watershed and to, and to do more restoration work in that lake. What kind of They won't get it. They're going to wait in line. Yeah, uh, no, we're, we're talking. Now, they're, they're not even on this list, are they? They, I, I think they are on the list, but they're not. They'll be waiting longer for their money, just like Blackhawk Lake up in Sac County, a public natural lake. But so, but so uh, Lake Dela, I can cut in front of the line, even though it's primarily a. I mean, it really is. You, you talked about one one public access point on that lake. That has been the history. Is there's been, and I think they're promising there will be more, but it'll still be essentially a private. Lake. Historically, it's it's an eight eight or nine mile long lake with one public right. access. Think of sixteen point. to eighteen miles of shoreline, almost all of which is <laughs> private. The okay. other thing I, I think that's important is, uh, and this this sounds complicated, but it isn't the watershed to surface water ratio. Lake Delhi over that sixteen to eighteen miles of shoreline has only four hundred acres of water. It's very, very small. It has a 200,000 acre watershed. The, it, the ratio is 500 to one. That is a terrible ratio in terms of runoff and silt and sediment accumulation. Uh, the recommended ratio is about 40 to one. It's about eight times, more than that, about 12 times the recommended ratio, which means it's guaranteed to silt in accumulate sediment and you need to understand the cost of dredging is, uh, um, excuse me, is the, co the cost of dredging is we go into seven figures very quickly whenever we talk about dredging. Dredging yeah. costs millions of dollars. You got to find out what to do with it, where to put it. And it was uh, so so much. Uh, I mean, dredging is necessary on practically any man-made lake, even if even if the watershed is relatively small. At some point, you're probably going to need some level of dredging. That's so, right, but you can improve things a lot. Lake Aquabi down here in Warren County, another state park lake, is an example where they went in and spent a lot of money on the watershed, put right. in smaller dams. Yep. To protect the main lake, and then they then they did some dredging in Aquabi and some. But that uh, cuts your cost over the long haul. Yes, yeah. it, it it prolongs the life yeah. of the lake. But but one question you have to ask is: Should some of these lakes remain rivers? And I know one one battle that I got into when I was in the state legislature was trying to trying to help uh, farmers who wanted to prevent their land from being condemned through eminent domain to build a private lake. Um, we've been successful at stopping that in Page County and in Madison County in uh, Clark County. Um, I'm blanking on a couple of the other places, but you know, all over the state, there are private interests that wanted to come. I mean, Doug right. Gross is a great example. Doug Gross has a beautiful, you know, cabin. You can imagine how spacious a Doug Gross cabin would be. Um, on uh, is it called Clanton Creek, I believe, down in uh, Madison County. Well, he would love to see that turned into a, a lakefront property. Yeah, and uh, I'm not happened, necessarily but... against, ar I'm not against artificial lakes. And in southern Iowa, um, artificial lakes make a lot of sense. But if they're private, the public shouldn't be paying well, for them and they shouldn't be using them in a domain. Well, and, so. and I don't, yes, exactly. I don't, I don't mind if, if, it's, if, it's, if it's private property where the landowners agree to have that happen, Fine. But if you're coming in with uh, government authority and condemning somebody else's land for someone else's benefit to build a lake, that ain't right. It's not right. No. And again, this is um, this happened back in the 20s. And, and originally, Lake Delhi was a, a way to generate power. That's right. And I don't know, at some point, you know, I mean, everybody likes to live next to water, right? Right. Yeah. I've got a bird bath in my backyard. The, a I lot love of, the bird bath in my backyard. A lot of people would like to live next to a river. I well, mean, yeah. They, they well, actually, actually, that... that uh, eight nine miles of, of riverfront along the Makokota River is a beautiful area. Mm -hmm. Those those homes are nestled in the woods. Uh, they have potential value just as yeah. riverfront property. But the, but people who have been used to water skis and jet skis yeah. can't relate to that. That's right. the problem. It, it needs a different set of of, of owners values. who have different, different a different values. set of values, I mean, a, a different vision, if you will. Yeah. A vision of a canoe as opposed to a jet ski. Well, but that's not quite as exciting for some people. a beauty of a free-flowing river. Yeah, yeah. Well, we might have to get there because I don't know if we can afford the price tag on this sort of thing. And again, you could argue that if we have these lakes that are public, then maybe some of those should be maintained, at least for now. But yeah, you're not sending a very good example, Iowa Senate, with um, $5 million for one private lake and $5 million for everybody else's public lakes combined. Anyway, Mike Smith. 
Not Mike Murphy. Mike <laughs> Smith, it's been great having you on the show. Uh, enjoy your retirement. I'm glad you're continuing to do good work. Appreciate your long service with the estate, including your time at the Attorney General's office. Well, thanks very much, Ed. It's been a pleasure to be with you. All right, folks, uh, we'll be back to, uh, tomorrow. Tomorrow, let's see. What are we talking about tomorrow? We're talking about energy, nuclear power, the Volt. Why does why does Mitt Romney hate the poor little Volt? Come on, it's a great car, 61 miles to the gallon. Europe's um, car of the year, and yet Mitt Romney and others don't like the Volt? Go figure. And we're also going to talk about wind. There is a study suggesting that uh, too much reliance on wind means... Uh, depleting that natural resource. I'm having a hard time wrapping my mind about that. We're going to talk about that. Ed Woolsey, a guy who knows more about wind and is quite a windbag himself. He's going to join us tomorrow. We're going to talk about that and get into these other issues as well. I hope you'll take the time to tune in. And again, if you missed this show live, it's there as a podcast on my website, FallonForum.com. If you'd like to get an advance notice about what goes on during the week, I send out an email on Monday. Click subscribe when you go to FallonForum.com, and we'll keep in touch. I want to thank Webcast One Live for helping to sponsor the show and all the local businesses who helped uh, make this show possible. We'll be back tomorrow on the Fallon Forum. Leach, owner and general manager of Service Legends. Oh, I brought uh, along a couple of the uh, home comfort heroes. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tammy Wells. I am Nick Wondershot. I am administrative manager. I am the senior technician. From Service Legends. It seems like every good thing, when you feel it to the bone that it's good, there's a lot of hard work put behind it. You just, I, I don't think that you can fake it and have it turn out good. You know, if we seem like, okay, that's just weird, it's just a furnace, why would you believe so deeply in a furnace? It's not just that, you know, we want to show the world that you can have good service. Yeah, I mean, it's got to be, it's your home. You know, it's, it's built into our daily trainings, it's built into our culture, um, that we're going to do whatever it takes to have each client say, they love us, period. That's why we spend all the hours in the training that we do. And 